Um, sorry, I, I'm apparently supposed to be like giving three seconds in between my face popping onto the screen because there's a lag between um, the 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 voice and anyways. <laughs> um, Thanks everyone again for attending uh, CSCon. This is uh, th we're we're on day three of CSCon one, um, and we've already had some awesome talks um, in the morning, and we'll continue to roll through until four p.m. Eastern today. Um, and yeah, great great talks coming up, uh, including Ethan Buckman in about half an hour, and. Um, Robert Habermeyer at around like 2.30, I believe. And of course, many other talks in between too. Um, but right now we have another awesome speaker, um, this time from the Ethereum ecosystem. And let me just pull up my notes here. Um, his name is Alex Stokes. Alex Stokes is a researcher at the Ethereum Foundation who focuses on security and scalability of the protocol. He has lately been working on delivering the merge um, TM and analyzing the stability of the proof of stake beacon chain. Happy birthday, beacon chain. When his hands are not full of R&D work, he likes to think about public goods. Yes, public goods funding and how we can turn short term games into long term ones. Very, very important. Always play long term games. I think I believe that's a novelism. Um, and here to present um, the Ethereum ro roadmap beyond proof of stake with sharding and statelessness is Alex. Alex. Feel free to unhide your camera, unmute your microphone, and come on up. Okay. Hey, can you hey. hear me? We can hear you fine. There's a bit of an echo, but maybe it will just resolve. Yep. And I'll uh, I'll let you take it away, Alex. Thanks, Tim. Let's see. Uh, okay. You can see me, and uh, hopefully you can see the slides. Let me just double check. We can see your slides. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, yeah. So uh, I had a great intro from Tim. Thanks for having me. I'd like to talk about the Ethereum roadmap today. So uh, you saw Tim Bako's talk the other day, uh, kind of leading you up from now until the merge, which I'm sure if you follow Ethereum at all, you've heard plenty about. Uh, it's a very long-winded move for us to go to proof of stake and moving away from proof of work. So what I want to talk about today is sort of what happens after that. Uh, and some of this stuff is more R&D and less sort of like ready to go into production. So some of it will be a little more speculative, but hopefully you get a flavor of uh, where things are heading and uh, what other exciting stuff we have in store. So first, who am I? Uh, Alex Stokes. This is my handle on like Twitter, Telegram. GitHub, like I think most things. Uh, I work on protocol R&D at the F and yeah, focused on lots of things with uh, this umbrella of ETH2 that I'll speak to in a second, but proof of stake, sharding, like clients for the beacon chain, all of this good stuff. So like I said, I wanna to talk today about what comes after the merge, uh, the merge TM, because uh, there are many sorts of merges, but this is a very important one. And this kind of goes uh, together with Tim's talk from the other day, I believe day one. And so uh, maybe you want to look at that after this if you missed it. Uh, this should be fairly self-contained, but essentially, uh, like I said, it's it's his talk was covering from now until you know the merge next year. And then now what I want to say is what comes after that. And first, some context. So, uh, if, I mean, yeah, <laughs> from the very, very beginning of Ethereum, there is this like longer term vision of these series of upgrades, uh, you know, through like Frontier, Homestead, Constantinople, Metropolis, all of these things, uh, cumulative serenity, which would sort of be this like final resting place for Ethereum where like the development of the protocol would be done, done in some sense. And over time, it's like changed. A lot. Uh, there's been a ton of research and development over even like the last few years that have like heavily influenced what this looks like and what makes the most sense. Uh, you've probably heard this phrase ETH2. Uh, and again, that's a nice way to like refer to all these different things in Umbrella. But um, we're kind of moving away from that because ETH2 kind of implies, you know, the thing after ETH1. And then that already implies that what we have today is ETH1. And then there's this like sequence. And the point. Ethereum, uh, and there's all these different things we can do to improve Ethereum. 
Uh, importantly, right, we want to support billions of users in a sustainable way. And the only way that really matters is if we can retain the decentralization that gives Ethereum its strength in the first place. So the question is like, how do we do this? It turns out it's quite hard. But uh, actually, let me switch back over here. If anyone has any questions, you can maybe ask in the chat. I don't think I'll quite see them because I'm looking at the slides, but uh, feel free to ask. And definitely I'll try to make time at the end for Q&A. Uh, all right, so uh, what we have so far uh, is the merge. This is imminent. Uh, and again, it's moving Ethereum to a proof of stake based consensus from today's mainnet, which uses proof of work. And there's a catchy little phrase here of the three S's that we get from this. We should have enhanced security, enhanced sustainability, and enhanced scalability of the protocol. And the merge kind of lays the groundwork for this. Uh, I did want to call it here with sustainability. You have both in protocol senses of the word and also out of protocol senses of the word. And so what I mean by that is that uh, there's sustainability in the protocol sense, which is like, how do we make sure that the protocol can you know, be easily run in like five years, 10 years, 100 years. And that's something we're gonna talk about later in the talk. Uh, as soon as the merge happens though, we'll have this other set of benefits immediately, which is this sort of out of protocol bucket. And the big one there would be the energy consumption. And I pulled this from one of the blog posts that we put out and uh, it just shows relative energy consumption per transaction. So, you know, if you look at uh, energy consumption for a Bitcoin transaction, it's something, you know, on the scale of the Burj Khalifa. And if you look at Ethereum proof of work today, there's less hash power securing it. So there's less energy that has gone into it. So it's much less small. And then you get to eat through the stake. Uh, it's like a screw, right? And you can look at the numbers, but basically it's like orders of magnitude reduction at each step. Um, so that should be great, right? Uh, for the free ecological benefits of Ethereum. And just to round out this picture, the other thing would be, yeah, the security of the protocol, right? Where there's already over 8 million ETH that are staked, uh, today's prices, that's over $40 billion of collateral protecting the beacon chain. So the idea is to take the Ethereum mainnet state today, uh, merge it into this proof of stake chain called the beacon chain, uh, and start to see some of these benefits today. And then now for the rest of the talk, we'll, we'll discuss like what happens after the merge. Um, and it's kind of some of these other things that we want to see in Cernity but didn't quite get to or won't necessarily get to with just the proof of stake. And that's the uh, focus on scalability via sharding and then how that enhances the role of the ecosystem. And then also this, this notion of sustainability, not so much in the ecological sense, but in terms of how do you run the protocol and like, is that feasible or tractable to do? Uh, and I'll kind of all of this in more detail now. So, oh yeah, so before we dive into it, uh, this is a tweet from Vitalik and uh, very conveniently timed for this talk uh, because it's it's sort of a, a latest pass of the roadmap as he sees it. Uh, and we have these cute names like the merge, the surge, the verge, the purge, and the splurge. <laughs> uh, and they're pretty fun, but basically, uh, you know, the merge is what we've been working on. The surge is the scalability increase to the chain. The Verge is a move to a vertical tree, which I'll kind of get into in a little bit, but essentially um, it's changing the state representation of Ethereum, which is like one of the core bottlenecks of the whole protocol. Uh, so it's very important. And that sets the groundwork for uh, statelessness. Uh, there's the Purge, which is getting rid of old history. And the Splurge is like this sort of catch-all bucket for all this other stuff. Uh, so like I said, I'm going to focus on scalability with sharding and then the sustainability, or sorry, scalability with sharding and sustainability with these other two. Uh, and there's a bunch of cool stuff in this last bucket, but different talk, different day. So first, uh, scalability. And the way that we're going to get around this or the way that we're going to address this at, at L1 at the, with the core protocol is with this concept of sharding and in particular data sharding. So first you might ask like, what is sharding? broadly and one way to think about it is that rather than having one blockchain like ethereum today you have like you know some some you know some, some number of blockchains in parallel so uh here this image is supposed to communicate there's 64 of these blockchains or shards that are working in parallel and the idea is that they would periodically check in their latest state latest block to the beacon chain so the beacon chain serves as this like uh 
place of record of like what the shards actually do, but then the actual economic activity or the actual transactions that take place would be on the shards. Uh, and this is how you get some scalability is rather than having the one chain or the beacon chain, you can now have 64 of these shard chains. And then the trick is like doing this in a way where you can validate each shard without having to necessarily run the full shard itself. And there's differences of sharding. Like historically, the thought is like, you literally just have 64 more blockchains like we do today. And this is called executable sharding because it's like a fully executable smart contract platform. And the idea is very uh, interesting, right? Definitely. But it turns out there's like some kind of thorny theoretical issues that come into play because uh, now rather than, you know, well, okay, I'll give you an example, which is like, if you have a transaction on one shard that depends on a transaction on another shard, uh, if the first one fails in some reason, it has to roll back the second, the dependent transaction. And in the worst case, you have these like cascading rollbacks across the entire set of shards, right? So uh, it's not that it's possible, but it's not as straightforward. And so a simpler version of sharding that doesn't have some of these more theor like thorny issues is rather than having execution of the shards, you just use them as like buckets for data. I said here, provide data bandwidth. And like, that's actually just what it is, is uh, rather than have, uh, you know, transactions that execute and like change some state, they actually are just like flat bytes and they can do whatever you want. Um, and if you're familiar with rollups, it turns out this is great because this is exactly what rollups want. Rollups are an L2 construction. So you have the execution of the rollup happening at layer two. At layer one, you have the data that's like committed to or checked into the chain. And uh, these actually pair really well. So I'll quickly go into how rollups work. I mean, the question right really is like, how do we scale blockchain? And so uh, the first, uh, this upper chain here is just supposed to be like Ethereum today where we just have a chain of blocks. And then what you can imagine doing is say, okay, well, if we want more transactions per second, we'll just make bigger blocks. So that's why I try to draw here. You just literally make the blocks bigger. And uh, this is interesting. It seems like it's pretty straightforward to do. However, it doesn't work for us because it's going to harm decentralization. And the reason why is because it's going to make it more expensive to run a node. It takes some amount of computing power to process each of these blocks today. And if you make them twice as big, let's say, you now need double the resources to process these blocks. That raises the floor to like run a node. And because of that, fewer people run nodes. The network becomes more centralized. And even like they said in the last talk, right, this is something that you're going to hear over and over in this space that this is kind of the core property that uh, we're all trying to to build around and provide is decentralization. So you can't just raise the the gas, the, the gas ceiling, although lots of people uh, definitely ask for that all the time. So instead, uh, we're going to take this notion that less is more. And the way we're going to do that is now there's like layers of these blockchains. And rather than have execution happen uh, at the at L1, you're going to push execution to L2. And so then all you have to really do is push some commitments to the, the base layer. Nodes who execute the L1 protocol don't need to really care what the execution of the L2 is. And this is in a very compressed explanation what a rollup is. And so that's what I tried to show here. This L1 is like layer one. So this is, this is Ethereum today. Uh, you have L2, so this is like some rollup, and I tried to draw these like bigger colored blocks, which would be the L2 blocks. So you can still have this like bigger blockchain. It's just happening outside of the core Ethereum protocol. And uh, the cool thing about rollups is that you actually retain the security of the layer one while still having this this more scalable context. So there's like a really important caveat though, which is that. Uh, there's this key property called data availability that you need to provide for the rollup to be secure. And the way that this works is that um, in the worst case here, so like an attack you could do, well actually, so I have an example that might be easier. This is kind of a dense slide, but the, for the L2 to be secure, you need to have guarantees as a user from the L1 that you can exit the rollup. Uh, and you know, an example I'll give now is that you could have a rollup operator who just stops making blocks. And so let's say you're over here, you have, uh, let's say you put 10,000 die into the rollup and you're like yield farming with it, doing whatever nonsense. And that's fun and good, but then suddenly the rollup operator goes down and then you're, are your funds stuck? Like what's gonna happen? Well, it turns out no, because 
if the roll up is secure, you then have a way to provide a proof that you have these assets at this particular time. You can provide the proof right in this block to uh, the next, actually, I wonder if you can see my mouse. Perhaps not, but anyway. Uh, in the third block here, you can see a proof. Uh, you can make a proof as a user, give that to the, the rollup infrastructure on L1. It can verify that against what the rollup has committed to, and then you can withdraw your assets and what you need to do. Um, and the thing I was trying to get to here is that this is important. Uh, it's important that you have the full, uh, the full history of the rollup because in general, you're going to need the complete state in order to make this proof. So uh, this is why we need some something to provide the, the history, the data of the rollup. And uh, sort of the answer so far has just been to use the existing Ethereum chain. Like we all on Ethereum. And because of that, right, we have data in blocks. You can put call data into the transactions. And then now you have this data, this, this available data space. And we just have these like norms in the space that you know, there are enough nodes that have this data for you and it's easily retrieved and, and all this good stuff. Um, and that's great for rollups, but uh, again, we only have the one sort of Ethereum chain today. And so that's not as scalable as we would like. And because now we need this data construction, uh, we see that with sharding, it helps scale this, right? Because now rather than be limited by the one chain, you're now limited by how many shards you have. And if we only need data availability out of them, uh, hopefully you understand now that this is like uh, it's kind of a match made in heaven. It works really well. And then we can defer some of these like thornier issues around executable sharding to the future if we even need to, right? It could be the, the case that like we have, you know, I don't have a graphic, but essentially we could have like another layer on top of these first two. So the beacon chain, shard chains, and then you could think of all the rollup chains hanging below them. And it could be that that's fine. Like we could get to a scalable Ethereum that way and never need to make the shards executable. As a quick aside, uh, I would give a short, sh uh, a short shout out to this Twitter user, Eplena, and just check out their Twitter. If you're interested in this stuff, they have this whole perspective of like a modular blockchains architecture as like being the way forward. I think there's definitely some interesting ideas here. At a high level, it's taking this like monolithic approach to building blockchains and breaking them into layers. So then you have a sediment layer, a data layer, execution layer. And it turns out that now with each of these layers, you can scale them independently. There's different techniques you can do at each layer to, based on your application, uh, scale it in the ways that you need. And uh, this picture kind of goes really nicely with what I just described, where you have the beacon chain as this like final sediment layer. It's super secure, hard to reorg, all of this. You have the shards as this data layer. So now you have like lots of data bandwidth of whatever the execution layer wants, wants to do. Then you have execution layers on top. So like that's where your optimistic or your ZK rollups come in. And you now have this like much more scalable architecture. So anyway, if you're interested in this stuff, go check out his Twitter or however, I'm actually not sure who they are, but their Twitter, uh, also their medium, lots of fun stuff there. And yeah, just to close out here uh, quickly, how do we get to, you know, how do we ship sharding and all this? And the main blocker here is that uh, the, so sharding in terms of consensus, I think we have a pretty good handle on. There are some open questions around how to address the peer-to-peer -peer networking when the network is sharded. Um, and we've making lot, we've been making lots of good progress, but I think some of this is still in the R&D phase. Uh, and it turns out that's okay because, and I pulled this from Vitalik's, roadmap that basically there's like phases of it where we can scale up the shard count over time. Uh, you know, something you might have seen the IP 4488, we could do this immediately just to basically make it cheaper for rollups. Uh, the next thing then is to increase the data bandwidth for rollups. And that's even just having like, I don't know, two, four shards. Uh, and essentially there, we just assume that beacon chain validators are honest in the sense of that they have the shards and they're doing their job and the shards are available and all this. Uh, then there's like other techniques like proof of custody, which I don't have time to go into, but there's other things we can do to basically change the sort of the, where the dial is in terms of security trade-offs between how many shards there are and how secure they are. Like is this like, uh, this full vision using again, the technique I don't have time to go into, but it's called data availability sampling where, uh, you basically then have every node contribute to network security, uh, and then. At that point, honestly, the scales, sorry, the shards scale with uh, the full node count on the network. 
So lots of fun stuff, a lot of exciting stuff going on. Sorry, it'll be fun. Uh, let's see. Okay, I'm gonna skip through the next little bit and try to leave time for questions. Um, let's see. So sustainability. So the first bit, right? I wanted to talk about sharding and how, like, how we hope to scale the protocol. Now we can talk about sustainability of the protocol. And this gets down to like kind of what I said before, where it's like, you know, there's a lot to do, but Ethereum arguably could become really important digital infrastructure in the future, right? And so now the question is like, okay, if I want to run a node and like today, what does that look like? If I want to run a node five years from now, do we just keep adding blocks? Like, does the state keep getting bigger and bigger? Like, how does this work? Um, and then obviously, you know, thinking further out, like 10 years, even a hundred years, like it's probably not going to work to assume a hundred years from now, I need to download today's block and, you know, verify it. So like, how does that look? How do, can we, can we improve the situation? Is that the best we can do? And, and that's kind of the questions here that are driving this bucket of, of things on the roadmap. And broadly, there's like two approaches here. The first one is statelessness. The other would be state and history expiry. So uh, if you follow any of this, I'm sure you've heard statelessness thrown around a lot. The idea with statelessness is that one of the core problems I kind of alluded to earlier is that like the problem with scaling Ethereum today is essentially the state. Uh, the state is like random access, which is not good for making hardware that accesses it efficiently because you just actually don't know how to like optimize. And state also grows because uh, it's really cheap, honestly, to to do so. Like every token contract that someone makes like adds to the state. So the state's really only getting bigger over time. There's not any strong notion of like expiring the state. Uh, there is like a self-destruct notion in the EVM, but it's like there aren't great incentives to use it. And anyway, the point here is that we want to say, okay, uh, if the state is like one of our biggest bottlenecks, like how can we fix that? And the cheeky answer is you go out of the state. So statelessness. And the other prong here would be state and history expiry. And this is literally just saying, okay, uh, kind of like I was saying a minute ago, it's like there's there's parts of the protocol that we just might not need. Like if you're using the protocol five years from now, like you probably don't care about like transactions from today, right? And so the question then is like, what's safe to expire? What are the norms around like recovering the expired history? Because we still want to validate the full chain, right? And and what does that look like? So let's see. Uh, I might not have a lot of time for this, but essentially statelessness, um, I'll post the slides after on Twitter. So if you want to come back and read through these, please do. But essentially with statelessness, the idea is, uh, rather than have every node have the state, you attach the state that you need to every block. And the reason you do this is because now it, uh, makes it easier to build other types of nodes that don't maintain this, this huge growing thing and just can still validate the chain because what they need is given to them. Um, and the way that you do this is there's this notion of a witness, which is what I said. It's rather than have the full state to value every block, every block then it basically has the chunks of the state that it needs stapled to it. And then there's cryptographic techniques to verify that the witnesses are correct and that everything matches. Then you can verify just those transactions in that block using the witnesses as sort of like a, you know, a mini database. Uh, and then you can validate the chain that way is, uh, without having to need the full state, you can actually just keep just the witnesses and every block. So a block becomes self-validating in a sense, and that's really nice. And the reason why I want to do this, some of this is like actually kind of subtle, but the way to think about it is that we want to, um, we essentially want to keep the cost running a node, uh, at a fixed level. Like, especially what we don't want is we don't want the the cost to run the protocol to increase faster than like the underlying technology, right? So like maybe in five years, one terabyte of disk space will be nothing and it'll be fine. Um, it's already like in the past, say five years, become like much cheaper to get a terabyte of disk, right? So there's improvements over time that will happen, but we don't want the protocol costs to run ahead of the hardware cost, if that makes sense. And stateless, this is a great way to ensure that those two stay in sync because you can basically bound the, the protocol cost by tuning all these different knobs. Um, and then also there's like more of the design space of node type you can do, which what I've kind of been talking about so far is lighter full nodes, but also um, for sharded nodes. And so if you think about it, if you have a sharded blockchain by definition, you don't have every shard. And so then the question is like, how do I validate a chain I don't have? And statelessness is a way to do that. Uh, 
again, I'll kind of skip through this, but the, the bottom line is there's active ongoing R and D all sorts of fun things around like figuring out, okay, if we have these witnesses, like how do we account for them? How do we meter them? Is there's like, are there different ways to improve uh, the way witnesses are generated? And there is, there's this whole topic of vertical trees. Um, and then, yeah, just practicalities of, of like user interaction. So like as a user, right, it's like things change a bit. If I don't assume that my full node has a state, I might have to like generate these witnesses and there's a bunch of questions here. So I believe the latest thinking, I would point you to this note by Vitalik on his proposal to do this. Uh, and yeah, this I'll post the slides after so you could take a closer look. And last thing, state and history expiry. So uh, I looked at Etherscan even earlier today, they have charts on this stuff, just syncing a geth node, it was about a terabyte of like history of everything. And the last time I heard benchmarks, it was say 40 gigabytes of protocol state. And some of that depends on like your, your client implementation and like different optimizations they take, but you know, ballpark numbers use are right. And so the question is like, okay, do we need all of that data? And like I was saying a minute ago, it's like, you, you don't need like the early transactions as long as you can trust, right? That like the chain you have is valid and the history of the chain is valid, then you can prune that history if you don't need it. Right. And so this research effort is to do just that um, again at a high level with state expiry rather than have the full protocol state of all time you just basically cut all the different mutations of the state into epochs the a full node would only keep like the recent states the older stuff can be pruned if you need something from like the older epochs there's essentially a way for a user to revive it with again proofs against the old state that it existed and you bring it into the new state and history expiry yeah this is I think pretty straightforward. You just timestamp everything that your node has. If it's older than a year or something like that, you just delete it. With, this, with history expiry, it's less of a technical question and more a question of just like, what are our norms? Like, what does it mean to like have a fully validating node? Where do we get the history? Like what's acceptable in terms of people providing the history and a lot of fun questions like this. So here for state expiry, there's like a proto EIP again from Vitalik. And then for history expiry, there's an EIP here for fours. Definitely go check it out if you're interested in this stuff. So I think now I have a few questions. And actually maybe a very short time for questions. But uh, yeah, basically reach out to me. There's an eFound Discord. Please get in touch if you want to help with this stuff. There's so much to do. Uh, but again, like I said, the future looks very bright. And the future is bright indeed. And yeah, definitely, folks, follow Alex um, on his socials. I think it's this way. No, this way. This way. Um, uh, thank you, Alex, for, for your talk. Um, and, and thank you for going into a little bit of the, the Verge and I believe the Purge part of um, the Ethereum roadmap. The Surge. And, and, oh, the Surge. And who knows, maybe if you're down, you could join us next year again to explain the Splurge. Um, <laughs> Part of oh, the, yeah, I mean, that's all the fun stuff. That's the like when people talk about moon math and things, that's uh, that's where that comes in. Nice. Um, yeah. but yeah, I get like thank you so much for, for your time. Really, really, really have some questions from the audience if you're down to take some of them. Um, yeah, first question is from Anonymous with three upvotes How easy or complicated is it for a user to get and provide a proof to exit the rollup? This process should be easy for the end user. Any example of, of how it might work? Yeah, uh, I agree that it should be easy. Um, so, you know, the specific details will depend on the format of the rollup and like, you know, like Arbitrum or Optimism or like ZK Sync, right? They're all gonna have like different representations uh, on L1. And so that's gonna inform what these things look like. Uh, essentially, all of the rollups have state commitments, just like we have a state root on Ethereum today. And the way that would work is that you need to provide a Merkle proof from like whatever your rollup state representation is uh, from your state object, which could be like a token balance or it could be like a you know NFT uh, claim, right? One of these things, and that would go to the state root. And then uh, you know part of you know so i did say at one point right like a lot of this is just ecosystem efforts around l2s and that's because yeah it's doing exactly the stuff where it's like there should be easy out of the box tooling you know it'd be awesome right if it's even baked into like a wallet where you can just like tap a few buttons and then basically write it it does it all for you um there's nothing inherently like i think 
like, you know, it's not that we don't know how to do this. It's more just like doing it and like working through all the details. Thank you for answering that. Uh, next question. How does Ethereum plan on dealing with privacy? Is that on the roadmap at all? Right. Very important question. Uh, privacy is super important. So I, <laughs> I mean, also it's like a super, like, there's like so many notions of privacy and there's different layers of the stack, right? So like, I've been thinking about validator privacy some where it's like, even at that layer, it's like, there's things we can do to make sure validators are private. Uh, like for example, today, uh, you could actually go and like, I think fairly easily not de-anonymize a bunch of validators on the network. And so uh, instead we could actually employ cryptographic techniques to make that actually feasible. And the way that we do that is essentially make it such that you don't know until a block is produced who's supposed to produce it uh and there's like fancy cryptography to make that actually work um then there's like privacy at the user layer where it's like yeah you know how do i get my transactions out onto you know some validator some block producer um in a in like a secure and censorship resistant way and there's like you know a lot we can do there uh, I think when people talk about privacy here, they also think about things like Zcash or like uh, Aztec and everything they're doing with like ZK rollups, uh, Tornado Cash, right? Again, is like essentially a Zcash like thing on Ethereum. So that's the cool thing about the EVM, right? Is because it's general purpose, you can basically program these privacy features in. Uh, and so, you know, I would hope that sort of how we have, you know, the migration from like HTTP to HTTPS over like the last decade, let's say, we'd have where it's like maybe today you know you could like find my die transaction because it's sent in clear text but then one day it's shielded in some way um and yeah certainly lots of people are thinking about it i didn't talk about it today but it's uh it's very important the the stuff on vitalik's tweet that i i posted with um the splurge there's a bunch of stuff in there related to privacy cool yeah that's definitely something like i'd be interested in um learning more about uh especially for like privacy at the transaction level and, and at the user level um, mm -hmm. But thank you for answering that. Um, next question. Um, what would be the best application to be implemented in the shard? Right. So this kind of touches on what I was hoping to communicate, which is that to start, we won't have execution in the shards. And that's likely because we like may not need it. Like We certainly don't need it now. We may never need it because that the notion of like an application executing is just going to live at layer two right so it'll be in a roll up um and yeah like that's something else like i get the question it's like do i need to care about which shard my roll ups in and like well not really because the shards are just like like the sharding at that point is it maybe even misleading like you should just think of it as now there's like a huge uh you know there's like so many more bytes you know i will say a couple megabytes per second or per slot rather uh for each beacon block. So like each block of the chain now has this like extra capacity for just data. And it turns out that the just data bit at L1 is all you need to make much more scalable rollups. So then the question is now, okay, like I can make whatever application I want to uh, inside a rollup. And yeah, I mean, I think we're seeing right now this like explosion of innovation and, and development and activity at, at layer two happening. And it's like only gonna get crazier, I hope, you know, as, uh, as things progress. Thank you for that. Um, and then the next and last question is, and we should, this this user, we should not be calling it ETH2. It's, it's Ethereum consensus, everyone. ETH, it's not ETH2, it's Ethereum consensus. But um, the question is when ETH2 question mark smiley face. Right, uh, soon, TM, the classic, uh, <laughs> the classic response. I mean, all of this stuff, right? Like. It's hard to say like everyone I know who's working on the protocol is like so focused on the merge. Um, you know, I'll, I'll be, I would expect the merge to happen like in the next couple months. And then from there, this other stuff, right, is like, it's, it's kind of comes down to like being bottlenecked on like, uh, you know, development resources, like, um, you know, attention of different people in the space. Like, uh yeah it's just a question of like how how quickly we can work through all the issues and then move from like specs to like implementations and then test implementations to make sure they're secure and then like take them to mainnet and yeah i mean there's definitely a lot of people working on it and this is uh if anything this is my call to action to you listening is uh if you're interested in this stuff please reach out and get involved there there's there's you there's even beyond what i talked about today there's just, there's so much to do uh and it's it's 
yeah, I mean, you can directly help yourself. That's right. It's soon TM and uh, call to action, go and contribute. Uh, that's there you there you have it, folks. Um, and once again, Alex Stokes uh, social media information is here or there. I'm not sure with my if my video is mir mirrored, but it's on the screen somewhere there. So um, definitely follow him on Twitter and on Telegram and reach out and go build biddle build a I don't know how to pronounce that word. Um, hey, Alex, thank you for your time again. It was I, I, I feel so bad we didn't catch up in um, in Berlin when you're in the Chainsafe office the other time. But are you in yeah. are you in Austria right now? Uh, I'm actually in the Czech Republic meeting some oh. friends. Nice. Yeah. Are you just uh, traveling. Around? Yeah, for a bit. Yeah, and then I'm heading I'm heading back home in a couple weeks. Dope, dope. Well, yeah. uh, that's yeah, that's uh. That sounds like an amazing journey. And thank you again for your time, for sharing progress on Ethereum um, uh, today. And feel free to stick around. We have some awesome talks coming up. So um, yeah. happy to have you here. And yeah, let's stay in touch. And thank you again. Yeah, certainly. Yeah, thanks, Tim. Thanks for having me. Thanks to everyone who joined. And uh, I'll see you around. Bye. Bye. Cool, cool. That was an awesome talk. Thank you, Alex. That was great. Um, and, you know, coming up next, we have another awesome speaker. I got to stop using awesome as an adjective. <laughs> Anyways, um, an awesome. Ugh, um, we have an amazing speaker coming up next. Um, he is a dear friend of Chainsafe's whose work in the blockchain space is prolific. His tweets are always fire. I love I love his tweets. And some of his internet appearances include a feature on Anthony Pompliano's podcast. Um, some of his interests, no, in no particular order, and I stole this off of LinkedIn, is information theory, biophysics, machine learning, problem of inference, complex systems, blah, 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 blah. It, the list goes on and on. But then it also goes to music, positive psychology, red wine, cartwheels, and dancing. So... Um, would love to see a, a cartwheel uh, in action someday. Um, he works in software, research, education, and the garden. His name is Ethan Buckman, um, and he is currently working on Tendermint, Cosmos, inform Informal Systems, um, and Coin Culture Crypto Consulting. Um, Ethan is a co-founder of Cosmos and currently CEO, CEO at Informal Systems, um, and Joseph was uh, earlier with us and i think he's still in the crowd right now yes joseph hi hi joseph um informal systems is featuring quite heavily today in cscon one but anyways i digress ethan had an outstanding talk last year at cscon zero on the history of banking it was a phenomenal talk one of my favorites and in our correspondence for cscon one he said he was going to prepare something similar which makes me super excited um, and his talk is titled From Empires to City States, the Political Economy of Cosmos. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Ethan up onto the stage and say hi to everybody. Feel free to unhide your camera. Unmute your microphone. Michael, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank Hi. you so much for the lovely introduction. I'm glad my LinkedIn uh, bio was <laughs> <laughs> Of Of course. <laughs> representing the informal hoodie. Okay, I'll let I'll let you take the stage. I'm looking forward to your talk, and thank you for awesome. for being here today. Thanks a lot. Hi everyone. Uh, let's get this sharing thing going. Uh, this looks good. All right. Good stuff. So um, yeah, so I'm Ethan. You know, I've I've been introduced, so I don't have to say too much about that. Uh, co-founder of Cosmos, CEO of Informal Systems. I'll tell you just briefly about Informal. Um, you know, we're on a mission to be deeply ill institutions in society. Software, how we build and deploy it. Money, how we issue and distribute it. And organizations, how we own and govern them. And we work on all that in, in a lot of different ways. Uh, we do a lot of work in formal verification to try to improve the way we develop software. Uh, we build model checkers. Uh, we build tools that allow people to easily generate an infinite number of tests for their software. So rather than writing, you know, hundreds of lines of boilerplate code to test your software, you write 10 lines of TLA plus and you can generate an infinite number of tests. Um, we, we use that in security audits and so on. On the Cosmos side, we, we do a lot of a lot of R&D, a lot of protocol design. We built Hermes, which is 
uh, one of the, the leading IBC relayers. So we'll talk a little bit about IBC later in the talk, but that's the sort of you know networking piece that connects all these different blockchains together. We also run the Cephalopod Equipment Validator, which is um, you know a validator on a bunch of different Cosmos networks and hopefully um, more, more chains beyond. So if you're looking for a nice place to delegate uh, atoms or, or some of these other, other tokens, uh, the Cephalopod Validator is there for you. Uh, Informal is also structured as a worker cooperative. We care a lot about political economy. You know, we're not one of these people that, uh, one of these teams that say, oh, we're just on a mission to ship like a singular product. Uh, and so no political discussions. Uh, you know, every company is a deeply political entity and it, it's important. Uh, it's important to always remember that. And I like to generally talk about uh, political economy in these talks and not get too technical or, or, or too in the weeds. And, um, you know, I hope, hope people, um, Hope people enjoy that. So today, uh, this talk is titled "From Empires to City States: Political Economy of Cosmos." I'm not really going to talk about empires and city states. I just, I just like that, uh, like that title and, and framing to sort of remind us, um, remind us what we're doing, where we're coming from. As, as Tim mentioned, um, you know, I gave this talk last year at, at the Chainsafe Conference about the history of banking. It was called "Free as in Banking." It was a lot of fun putting that together. Um, you know, I guess uh, there's a lot of expectation about this talk because I've sort of built things up, but. Um, Hopefully it will it will it will follow in the footsteps. Well, there will be a little bit of repetition from from last year's, but but hopefully not uh, not too much. Um, and so I'm just gonna jump into it. So here we go. Uh, whose money is it anyway? Right. So so you know all this stuff about blockchains, cryptocurrency. So much of it has to do with like money and and what are we doing with money? Um, you know, I like to say that that Cosmos is actually a, a political economic philosophy masquerading as a blockchain technology. Uh, and, and, you know, Cosmos is, is really about transforming the way we think about uh, and, and interact with money in the long term. And it takes a long, long time to get there. There's a lot of infrastructure we have to build up. But the reality is that, you know, the central banks, have, you know, people like to think they're responsible for money and that. But they've just done such a terrible job um, of managing things and sort of under their watch. We've developed this incredibly unsound and unsustainable system of, of global finance, which has literally become an existential threat to the species and, and the planet at large. And so obviously, you know, these people can't be trusted with money anymore. Not to say, you know, I'm not going to go all conspiracy and say, oh, they're malicious, they're taking over the world. I just, I just don't think they understand. They're just bad scientists. Um, you know, economics is, is sort of riddled with, with, uh, with, with bad scientific method and, and issues. Uh, but the central banks really don't seem to know what money is anymore. They've, they've kind of lost control of it. You know, they think they control money with all this bank reserve stuff and quantitative easing and stuff they're doing, but, but that's not money. Um, I've never used a bank reserve to pay for anything. Like Bitcoin seems to be more money than, than a bank reserve is, uh, but that's all the central bank can see. Um, and, you know, the reality is that the commercial banks are really the ones that are sort of most involved in, in creating money and issuing money. But the central banks don't really understand that and don't really seem to know what the commercial banks are up to. Um, and one of the, you know, one of the big risks or issues about all this central bank digital currency stuff is that like, they're just going to increase that tunnel vision further. It'll further empower central banks who don't know what they're doing. And this most critical, you know, sociological technology money uh, will just be further deteriorated and uh, and we'll have more issues and so on. And, you know, a lot of Bitcoiners and crypto people think, oh, the answer is like Austrian economics and we just need sound money and blah, blah, blah. I mean, that's a very naive, uh, limited uh, approach. I mean, there, there's some good good ideas there, but we, 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 need, we need to go a lot further. So what I'm going to start with um, is just talking a little bit about alternative monetary arrangements, um, some historical, some current, um, and, and sort of work our way up uh, from kind of simple ones to more institutionally complex ones, um, and, and just think, think a little bit through like, like what they mean and, and, and how they could be applied. Sound good? Yes, everyone is stoked. All right. Um, so this is one of my favorite examples. There was a man named Joshua Abraham Norton who lived in San Francisco in the 19th century. A normal guy, businessman, built a bunch of wealth in commodities and real estate. Uh, at one point, he had the grand idea to corner the rice market, uh, and he failed. He just, you know, as, as most people do when they try to corner a market. Uh, and he went bust, and he kind of disappeared. And then eventually, he shows up again in San Francisco and declares himself emperor of the United States and protector of Mexico. And you know, this is something that, that people on the streets of San Francisco might might do still to this day, just like pro procure themselves the emperor of, of, uh, of something. Uh, and, and the good Emperor Norton did so. What was unique about, about, uh, about our, our dear friend uh, Joshua Norton here, who we should now call uh, the Emperor Norton, is that he was actually able to issue a currency backed by the full, uh, uh, full faith and credit of his imperial government. 
which he claimed was, you know, the United States and, and Mexico. And he got that currency actually accepted uh, in certain establishments that he frequented in, in San Francisco. So he could go to bars, he could pay for drinks with the money that, that he printed under, uh, you know, as the emperor of the United States uh, and, and the protector of Mexico. And I, I just love this example because it just like really hammers home the extent to which money is a sociological phenomenon. Uh, it's grounded in trust. It's grounded in interpersonal relationships. And, and in principle, any individual can issue their own money and, and get it accepted um, as, as, you know, settlement media, as payment for debts or, or for goods and services. And, you know, Emperor Norton always sort of, sort of reminds us that, that this is possible uh, and, and doable and that he was able to do it. There's a wonderful quote by uh, Robert Anton Wilson, who wrote the Principia Discordia. Uh, it goes like this. Everybody understands Mickey Mouse. Few understand Herman Hesse. Only a handful understood Albert Einstein, and nobody understands Emperor Norton, so be like him. That's Emperor Norton. That's our sort of simplest, uh, you know, starting point for, for some alternative monetary arrangements. Not saying that, you know, everyone should go issue their own money and declare themselves the emperor, but sort of a fun place to start. The next, the next example that, that, that I quite like um, is from the 1930s, and I talked about this a little bit in the, in the Frias and Banking talk. Uh, this is known now as the Virgo experiment or the miracle of Virgo. Virgo is a, a small town in Austria. Uh, like every other city on the planet in the 30s, it was suffering from um, the Great Depression and was sort of, you know, uh, its economy was in shambles. No one was, was spending money. It was uh, sort of a crisis. Now, there was a guy, an economist named Silvio Gessel, uh, who lived in the late 19th century, early, early 20th century, who had this idea uh, that was really grounded in, he was sort of a follower of Henry George. Now, um, we could, we could do a whole talk on Henry George. I would love to. Henry George is sort of a long forgotten, brilliant political economist of the 19th century. He was one of the founders of the progressive movement in the US. Um, uh, he, he wrote a book called Progress and Poverty that was the most popular book in English after the Bible in the late 19th century, but probably you know many people have not, have not heard of it. I think a lot of blockchain people are starting to get into his ideas. Henry George's core idea was that the source of value uh, in the world is really land. Land is the sort of primary factor of production. and uh, the idea that we could have private property over land, there's just no ethical basis for that. The only way to acquire private property and land, uh, if you reason through it, you'll probably discover too, is either through theft or murder or genocide or some other, you know, uh, criminal violent act. And of course, human history is littered with these kinds of acts. And for some reason, we just accept, um, we just accept the outcome and respect all this, all this private property of land, which is, you know, uh, problematic uh, for many reasons. But Henry George made the argument that because of this private property on land, landlords are able to extract rent uh, and all the progress in productivity um, that should be accruing to workers actually accrues to landlords. And this is sort of the grand problem with why we make so much progress and yet poverty uh, still kind of increases. And so Silvio Gesso was, was sort of follower of George and extended those ideas to money. And he said, you know, why should it be that people who just hold money and do nothing with it accrue interest on that money? I mean, it's not doing anything uh, anything productive. Money is not something that you should be able to really store value in, you know, contrary to what, what, what so many people in, in crypto will say, money is really a tool for facilitating trade and exchange. Uh, and, and that's really what it's for here. Um, and so the, so, so Gessel had this idea of what he called demurrage, um, which was the idea of a negative interest rate applied to money to sort of force it to, to circulate. So, uh, you know, it, uh, it would it would allow it would force people to want to spend their money uh, more quickly and not just hoard it. Um, and this had a huge impact in in the town of Virgo, where the mayor sort of rolled out this experiment, uh, where they would affix a postage stamp every day that you held money, and so that would sort of encourage people um, to spend it more quickly, so they wouldn't incur this cost. And the the town of Virgo just rebounded completely. The economy was booming. It's now known as a miracle. Um, and of course, the Austrian bank showed up. The Austrian central bank showed up and shut this thing down. And said, "Nope, this is this is this is bad. Uh, we're not going to let this happen." And that was sort of the end of the the Virgo experiment, unfortunately. Um, so the next example I want to talk about are, are mutual credit. So we went from you know individual issuing their own money to sort of city issuing their own money, and and now I want to talk about sort of a, a, another institutional structure that allows a, a community to actually issue their own issue their own money in the form of what's known as mutual credit. And there's there's a great example here, the Veer Bank. So, you know, in Switzerland in the 30s, also struggling with the depression, a group of businesses came together and said, hey, let's create a cooperative that allows us to take out loans collateralized by our future production. So what that means is if you're a business in this cooperative, you can take out a loan, say, you know, a thousand Swiss francs uh, and promise you promise to pay it back. Uh, you promise to collateralize it by accepting some multiple of that, say 5,000 francs, as payment for your own goods and services. Now, now the Veer Bank 
uh, you know, couldn't necessarily issue Swiss francs, so that so they have a sort of complementary currency that they call Veer franc that only exists within within the Veer Bank cooperative. You can't redeem it uh, for Swiss francs. It can't really exit the system, though it is pegged one to one. But it can only be used to pay for goods and services within the system, right? And so, so that's the sort of idea with mutual credit, and it's been shown that uh, the Veer Bank system, that the fact that it exists in Switzerland and it exists at sort of a national level, so any business in Switzerland can, can access it, it has had a material impact on stabilizing the economy of Switzerland in during cyclical downturns, when, when credit conditions are tight, uh, when people can't access this franc, they can turn to the Veer franc uh, and access liquidity that way. And that has had you know a significant impact on, on stabilizing um, the Swiss economy. So this is a very powerful, a very powerful mechanism and, and, and institutional design as an alternative to sort of central bank or, or a complement uh, to what central banks are supposed to do, you know, counter cyclical stabilization. There's a few other examples of, of mutual credit systems that are, that are more recent. So the Veer Bank goes back to the 30s. It's maybe the, you know, uh, largest and longest and most successful complementary currency system. But there's uh, Sardex, which launched in, in Sardinia maybe a decade ago, and it, it is gaining quite a bit of popularity. And there's Grassroots Economics, which has been running in Kenya, also a, a mutual credit system allowing, you know, small producers and, and, and marketplace sellers to, uh, to take out loans collateralized by their future production. So it's a very very powerful um, and, and enticing system. But the challenge with mutual credit is, you know, it does need it does need um, to leverage a unit of account. It does need to issue its own medium of exchange within the system. So you do have loans going on and, and you have to manage that and you have to deal with defaults. And there's a lot of complexity. And it can be difficult for these things to scale. Now, another uh, another kind of example of, of a monetary arrangement, which is much less well known is the idea of credit clearing, right? And so there's this amazing paper that came out about a year ago called Liquidity Saving Through Obligation Clearing and Mutual Credit and Effective Monetary Innovations for Small and Medium Enterprises in Times of Crisis. So that, that's certainly a mouthful, um, but you know this was an academic paper. And uh, the idea behind credit clearing is that um, if you have a group of businesses and they're doing business with each other, and you know, say uh, you know, I owe Aiden $10 and Aiden owes Tim $10 and Tim owes me $10, uh, normally, I would have to come up with ten dollars from somewhere, go find a ten dollar bill, or go to my bank and, and, and pay Aiden. And he'd pay Tim, and so on. So we'd, we'd have to like actually cough up the liquidity, the the real token, the real medium of exchange to clear these payments. With with credit clearing, all we do is surface the information about our existing obligations and search for cycles. And wherever we find a cycle, we can actually clear the payments in that cycle automatically without anyone having to come up with uh, with the medium of exchange, without actually having to come up with the liquidity powerful right because it means that so much of the pain that, that small businesses face of, of, of sourcing liquidity and, and you know making payments uh, a lot of it can actually be mitigated just by surfacing information about the possible closed cyclic loops within the economy they're participating in uh, that allows them to actually use their own invoices to pay you know what they owe to other people right so it's kind of a way of turning your accounts receivable or your accounts payable into a kind of currency even though it never really materializes as a currency it's not something you know you stick in an account and you have it sitting there uh, but you, you know everyone has outstanding invoices due to them that, that, that they have due to others and if you can use those to sort of clear against each other to do this kind of netting that can be um, incredibly powerful and it doesn't even require a centralized clearinghouse that everyone makes payments to you're just sort of surfacing information about who owns who owes what to who and then and then clearing any obligations where there's a closed loop and and this paper showed that if you combine credit clearing and mutual credit uh, you can save businesses up to 50% of their liquidity requirements, which is a, just, just a massive savings in, in pain and headache and liquidity for small businesses that they would otherwise only be able to get, you know, in a very expensive way from banks or, or have to suffer through, uh, through other means. So this credit clearing idea is very, very powerful and, and um, I think very exciting. And, and, we're, and, and you know, we, we've been talking to Tomas, this, this picture here came from Tomas. You, you should follow him on Twitter because he's always posting these beautiful, uh, beautiful uh, analytics uh, images of real world economies. This is actually a real world image of the economy, I think of, of, of Italy and sort of all the businesses and and um, and, and sort of, uh, you know, the network of obligations between businesses. And you get these really beautiful pictures where you can start to actually get at the substructure of the economy without thinking about banks and macroeconomic nonsense and, you know, aggregates and, and all this stuff. You can actually see the real sort of like, you know, graphical structure of the economy. And from that start to reason about, you know, the, the structure of the supply chain and sustainability and really incentivize more of these closed loops, which is really the essence of building a, a sustainable social economy, right? Rather than the sort of model we have now of just like, you know, completely linear systems where you just like take energy out of the ground and stick it into your pipeline and spit out waste and then leave the waste for future generations to deal with. You know, the, the crux of sustainability is really closing the loop, right? People call it circular economies or recycling or all of these sorts of notions. 
uh, credit clearing really gets it, gets at the heart of that and allows it to work itself in in a more iterative way into the economy without having to introduce a currency or, or any kind of, um, of of nonsense like that. So, so very, very, very powerful stuff here. Now, um, obviously, we could talk about that uh, extensively, but the next institutional structure uh, I want to get to is free banking. So the whole talk um, last year was really sort of, um, I think, uh, motivated by me having discovered free banking only last year and, you know, kind of been upset that, that nobody told, told me about it before because it's such a, a vital part of, of the history of banking and so misunderstood today. A lot of people hear free banking, they think like, oh, that must be, you know, the wildcat banks of the U.S., uh, in the in the 19th century that, that always went bust, they were always blowing up, like that stuff doesn't work. And, and it's true, the wildcat banking era of the US was a disaster, but it was largely a disaster because of very poorly thought out regulations on how banks were allowed to structure themselves, what kind of reserves they had to have, um, and, and really the inability for them to diversify across state lines, which made them sort of concentrated their risk and, and made them blow up more frequently. But there was uh, a real free banking regime in Canada, in Scotland, and, and a few other places. And what this comic is showing, this is a comic from 1825, showing the state of the of the money market, comparing London, uh, England, and Scotland. Of course, England had a central bank, Bank of England, and it was prone to, to crashes constantly, it had all these issues. Uh, you know, all the banks in England would use the central bank, they'd keep their reserves there, and it was just not a stable system. Versus, in, and so you can see here in the comic, you know, all the buildings are crashing down. This guy, this banker is just like not doing, you know, not going to make it, not doing well. Uh, and you look over at Scotland and things are fine. You know, everyone's just like banking like normal, hanging out in the, at the little teller. Everything's, everything's going great. And Scotland had like a proper free banking where there's no central bank, where you have, you know, private banks, each holding their own reserve, competing against each other, issuing their own notes against their own reserve, where their notes are redeemable at each other, right? So they're kept honest by this market mechanism, where on a daily basis or on a weekly basis, all their notes are cleared. Uh, and so they have to they have to be able to accept other people's notes and, and, and redeem them for gold, uh, accept their own notes, redeem them for gold, um, and so on. So everyone's sort of kept honest by this market mechanism, and that's really the power of, of the free banking system. And even you know, in the in the 19th century, there was a man named Walter Badgett. He was the the chief editor of the Economist, uh, and he wrote a book called Lombard Street in the 1870s that sort of set the foundation for what it meant to be a good central bank and, and sort of, you know, uh, 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 formalize the idea of lender of last resort and all this stuff is sort of like the, the Bible for, for, for central bankers, even though we've, we've you know, uh, we, we've ruined so much and not really followed his, his advice in, in many ways. But even he preferred this kind of free banking system. He referred to it as the natural system um, of banking. So. Uh, next institutional institutional structure is central banking. Our, our our favorite friends here, money printer go burr. On the left, we have sort of the modern, you know, twenty uh, first century meme of of the central bank just just cranking out money. On the right, we have you know a, a cartoon from eighteen sixty four or something like that of really the same thing. You know, just just running the machine, cranking out greenbacks. This is you know to pay for the civil war or whatever. And they didn't have a central bank back then, but it was sort of the same kind of idea that you know the government is just gonna just gonna crank out money. Um, and so, you know, nothing has really changed, say, in 150 years. Obviously, the institutional structure has changed quite a bit, and maybe our memes are a lot less uh, artistic. It seems there's a more crude quality to our to our artists today, and maybe that's the result of the internet, but uh, no matter. In any case, it's worth pointing out that the Fed, like I was saying earlier, it doesn't actually print money. Uh, it prints bank reserves, right? All this quantitative easing it's doing, those are bank reserves. Don't Those aren't money. You can't use that to buy coffee. You can't use it to buy anything. Banks use it as settlement media. Uh, but it's not real money. Um, and the Fed doesn't actually seem to understand money. They don't know how to measure it. They don't know how to create it. They don't create it. Uh, primarily, the commercial banks create it. Occasionally, the government will create it when it when it, you know helicopter drops money to everyone. Um, but most of the money is actually created outside the Federal Reserve, outside the government, in the commercial banking sector. Most of the money is in the form of euro dollars, which are this very mysterious, you know, shadow kind of money uh, that is made up of, of complicated derivatives on on bank balance sheets internationally. Uh, that really no one can really understand or 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 measure because it's all so um, opaque and, and and untransparent. Um, and and the central bank surely have have no idea uh, really how to measure euro dollars. And the last ten years, twelve years, or whatever since the crisis has really been a story about the collapse of the euro dollar system and the inability to sort of get it get it started again. And the central bank's trying to make up the difference by printing all these bank reserves, but it's just like not working, right? So I don't know what the end state is for this, you know, completely broken system. It's had like a, you know, 110 year run or, or longer, depending where you start from. Um, but but clearly something needs to change. And what I'm hoping is that, you know, we can take a, a mature, historically informed, you know, theoretically sound, ecologically grounded approach to how to evolve and mature uh, banking by leveraging these things like credit clearing and mutual credit 
uh, to actually allow the central banking system to gracefully sort of unwind this, this mess it's created and, and better empower uh, the social economy of, of different communities. How much time do I have? Um, I think we started a quarter after, is that right? Brutalist Brutalist um, Brutalist to take like five, 10 minutes more, 10, 15 minutes more. Should be good. Okay, perfect. Very good. Um, so the next, next institutional structure we all know and love is Bitcoin. I right? Bitcoin uh, sort of showed up in 2009 and was like, oh, you know, we're, a, we're an answer to the um, like brutally corrupt time system and um, let's get this thing. And of course, many people have gone on and everyone's talking about, oh, hyper organization or whatever. I mean, that's, that's a little bit a, a little bit you know, crazy. Bitcoin is incredibly valuable and powerful. It has a for what we need. A lot of people are like, oh, it uses all this energy. It's not for anything. You know, it's some like alt right, uh, you know, a revival of like uh, pure uh, Austrian economics or something. I think there's a. Hey, Ethan. S sorry to interrupt my sincerest apologies the microphone is sounding a little um unclear i'm not sure if something happened to the audio there oh no is that better yes a lot better sorry okay. sorry no problem i just moved it closer um i think the, the story of bitcoin is very nuanced i tried to write about this in, in this blog post orange is the new green if you're interested in, in, in checking it out but the reality is all of us are only here because of what bitcoin accomplished and, and because of the revolution that that Bitcoin uh, uh, initiated that allows us to really think about community money, you know, more broadly, and about building systems that can start to uh, that can start to heal these like deep institutional traumas and 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 wounds that have been afflicted over generations of just like not really thinking clearly about how to do money and, and what money is and, and its relationship to sociology and so on. So from Bitcoin to atoms, uh, the Cosmos Hub. So one way we think about what the Cosmos Hub is is sort of like Bitcoin, but with interoperability, right? It's kind of a, a conservative, low risk, uh, a low number of features, safe place for, for, for payments and for custodying assets and for accessing this sort of you know, decentralized ecosystem of services, but it's not sort of off on its own in a little silo the way, the way Bitcoin is, uh, it's interoperable. And everything the Cosmos Hub uh, has done and, and focused on and the Cosmos Project has focused on isn't enabling this kind of interoperability so that many blockchains can come online and can access services that are you know made available by the Cosmos Hub uh, and, and secured by the Atom token and the Atom taking on sort of a new kind of monetary monetary role in this in this larger ecosystem trying to you know extend this story of these alternative uh, monetary arrangements first by being really really a staking token and, and driving the security and you know, proving out this new kind of proof of stake model kinds of uh, of use cases as being kind of a you know key prime sort of collateral in the larger system and and being like a, a safe place for um, for the internet of blockchains to sort of explode around. And at the heart of of the Cosmos vision is this notion of sovereignty and interoperability. These are the these are key values that have driven everything. That every community anywhere should be able to be sovereign over their own applications and infrastructure, and yet still interoperable with everyone else. Right. So rather than like you know deploying a smart contract to some blockchain that doesn't care about you and uh, you know might upgrade or, or you're subject to its gas prices and all this stuff, you build an application specific to your community, run by your community, governed by your community, operated by your community, end-to-end -end sovereign, and yet still interoperable with everyone else. And that's really what, what the Cosmos vision is about. And you know, there's this idea in Ethereum of like the world computer. And you know, to me, the world computer is a lot like uh, a mainframe, right? It's like Dell talking about in the 30s, like, oh, there's going to be one mainframe and it'll It'll support all the world's computing needs, and everyone's going to do their computing on the on the Dell mainframe in our basement. Of course, that's not what happened. We got the we got the internet. We got the personal computer revolution. Everyone now has has a computer in their pocket on their desk, um, and they're all connected to each other over the internet, right? And so we don't have mainframes. Uh, we have personal computers and internet. And I think the same sort of thing is happening in the blockchain space. Rather than you know this world computer vision, what we're actually talking about are community computers. Every community can have its own computer, right? So it's not personal computer anymore. It's a personal computer owned and operated by a whole community. And each community gets its own computer. We call it a blockchain, whatever you want. I prefer community computer now. And they're going to connect to each other over a new kind of internet to create an internet of blockchain. And just like, you know, in, 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 the, in the internet of personal computers, we have a general purpose interoperability protocol, you know, TCP that allows all these computers to connect and, and share arbitrary information and communicate in arbitrary ways. In the blockchain space, in the community computer space, we have our own protocol that we call the Inter-Blockchain Communication Protocol, or IBC, the General Purpose Communication Protocol for arbitrary community computer, arbitrary communications with each other. 
what does that look like? Well, today it looks like this. This is just that, you know, this blows my mind every time I look at this thing. We've been talking about the internet of blockchains for like, you know, six years now and, and it's here, it's, it's coming, it's happening. There's, you know, this is from mapazones.com, which is tracking all these IBC enabled um, blockchains that are starting to talk to each other. So these are real live blockchains, community computers, whatever you want to call them. You know, there's like 25 of them or something. And they're all just starting to connect to each other permissionlessly using IBC, however they want, no enforced apology, no rent seeking, no one's thinking, oh, you have to use this, you have to pay this, you know, just, just complete sovereign interoperability, just an unbelievable, beautiful like to behold. I encourage you to go to mapazones.com and, and check out what's happening there because this is, this is really like, you know, the ARPA net, very early days, internet exploding and you can really watch it live. More and more chains are adopting IBC, even sort of outside Cosmos proper. Um, you know, there's work in, in the Polkadot ecosystem and another ecosystem to adopt IBC and connect into this, uh, you know, growing, uh, delightful um, uh, internet of blockchain. And of course, there's one blockchain that I was sort of um, talking a little bit about, the Cosmos Hub. It doesn't have any privileged role in this ecosystem that we enforce. No one has to pay, you know, rent to the Cosmos Hub to use all this amazing technology we created. But the Cosmos Hub is being designed to be a sort of port city, to be a place that is a, a primary entryway into the larger ecosystem, a place where you can access services, a place that really enables the larger interchain, um, you know, in, in sort of a safe, uh, lower risk, lower regulatory risk, you know, high security, uh, a delightful place to sort of integrate and have service providers integrate against while you go out and explore all the crazy innovation and, and happenings in the rest of the, the internet of blockchains that might be higher risk or doing other crazy things. The Cosmos Hub, sort of like a Bitcoin, is sort of stable, you know, safe, high secure place that's providing all these services, unlike Bitcoin, to the rest of the um, the rest of the ecosystem. So, um, you know, there's there's we wrote this blog post. The Cosmos Hub is, is a port city. You, you can go check that out if, if you're interested. And services we're thinking about that the Cosmos Hub uh, will provide that we're all working on to really, you know, support and specialize in. Uh, enabling all of these other blockchains to be more successful around it, right? And, and one of those key, um, one of the key features that everyone's really excited about is this idea of interchain security. I'm actually leveraging the sort of, you know, uh, security of the Atom token and the value of the Atom token securing the Cosmos Hub to secure more chains than that. And so we put out, put out a blog post recently about this and the Systems team is, is working on interchain security that will allow uh, the validators of the Cosmos Hub to actually run not just the one blockchain of the Cosmos Hub, but to use those staked atoms to run multiple blockchains sort of around the Cosmos Hub uh, over IBC, right? So we built IBC as a very general purpose protocol so that we can now build arbitrary applications on top. So rather than, you know, for instance, doing sharding first and just focusing on like a sharding specific protocol, we build a general purpose communication protocol and you can build, you know, different kinds of sharding on top. And one way to think about interchain security is it's sort of a kind of sharding, but, it, you know, very different. People will probably get mad at me for calling it sharding, so, you know, I won't, but the idea is that over IBC, you can build arbitrary applications and, and, and IBC is the sort of layered protocol that you can um, that you can extend and, and generalize in many ways. And, and so interchange security is being built over IBC. The validator set updates can get sent over IBC so that if the validator set on the Cosmos hub change, it changes automatically on these um, on these client chains that are sort of sourcing their security from the Cosmos hub. And this will mean if you're delegated to a validator on the Cosmos hub, you will then be earning you know, rewards, not just in atoms on the hub, but also in the tokens of those other chains. Thank you. So this will be, this will be a way to greatly expand the capabilities of the Cosmos hub um, and, and to use it to you know, have um, uh, bridges to other ecosystems or smart contract zones or all kinds of other functionality that we may not want to put directly on the hub itself because we want to preserve it as this sort of low risk, high security, kind of conservative, trusted place, but still want to be able to use the security there to secure other kinds of features and applications in sort of, you know, you, you think of these as like the suburbs or the, you know, the, the regions around the, the Cosmos Hub. Um, or city. So that's interchange security will be coming um, uh, next year. There's a lot of work already. There should be test nets, hopefully, uh, in the early part of next year. Uh, check out the blog post, check out the, the code. There's a lot coming. This is just one piece of what's coming to the Cosmos Hub, but um, there's a lot uh, going on there. Now, I think that's it for me. Um, if you're interested in any of this stuff, jobs.cosmos.network, informal.systems slash careers. Um, everyone is hiring. Thank you so much for your time and attention. And always remember, uh, money is the killer app. Dude, phenomenal talk. Again, you killed it again. Um, I love your little qu quips and, and history lessons. I got to learn more about Emperor Norton. That's uh, that's definitely <laughs> part about yeah um but yeah um and it's crazy how like the memes like from like 100 150 200 years ago are still kind of like the same and applicable now so it's just yeah and also another comment love the port city blog post um and also really like the community computer um 
analogy sort of tweet, um, which, is, uh, which is really good. Um, thank you. For, yeah, thank you again for, for uh, giving your talk. We have some questions from the audience. If you have some time to answer it, we'd yeah. love to hear your insights. So first question from Anonymous with two upvotes. In terms of currency demurrage, demurrage, I don't know how to pronounce the word. In, the, in terms of currency demurrage, I can understand the benefits of increased circulation, but how do you ensure that money is being circulated into productive means? That's a really good question. Um, and that question applies you know, broadly to, to any kind of system. Uh, in general, how do we ensure that money is being circulated in, in, into productive means? And it's a difficult thing to try to imagine enforcing from like a centralized party. Um, you know, from a sort of like localist and, and, and decentralization perspective, you have to imagine that if you set up, um, you know, the right mechanisms, people will use them, um, you know, for what they need for, for themselves, right? But if you, if you create sort of corrupt mechanisms or things that lead people in, in particular directions, then obviously a, a lot goes astray. So there isn't an, an easy answer to this. Uh, and, you know, I don't necessarily believe that, you know, every system needs to use demurrage and demurrage is sort of right for all. And that's the only way, only way to do things. I'm not necessarily claiming that I think it's very interesting and very, very powerful, very powerful mechanisms. But, but if it's not coupled with uh, sort of other, other kinds of institutional designs that really ensure, you know, uh, finance isn't being, you know, there's not too much financial speculation or people aren't just like consuming quickly um, because you can think of, you can think of demurrage as sort of like inflation in a sense. Right. And, and a lot of people think like, Oh, if there's too much inflation, there's just going to be too much consumption and, and, you know, that, that'll cause issues. But um, a lot of the inflation actually comes from the credit creation process. And so you end up with, you know, too much money chasing too few goods sort of issues. Whereas with demurrage, it's sort of a different mechanism at play. And even though, you know, in the long term, so to speak, they might look like they have the same kind of net impact, you know, as Kane said, in the long term, we're all dead. And so maybe the sort of long term asymptotic thinking isn't actually that helpful to economics. And it's really about, you know, what happens um, in the short term. So uh, Demarage at least can get people thinking, oh, I can't just hoard this and, and earn interest on it. I actually need to spend it on things I need. What do I actually need? Or, you know, what what do I want this money to be used for? And, you know, the idea is that would sort of promote more more productive activity. Thank you for that. Love love the like economics lens and frame like of perspective too. Um, so thank you for that. Uh, next question from uh, question MVP Jonathan Lormer, who has been asking questions huh? throughout the entire CSCon. He's on fire. <laughs> is, is the cosmos hub slash atom necessary i have seen criticisms of the value of atom recently and wondering if application specific blockchains plus ibc is enough for the cosmos vision yeah i mean it's an interesting question at, at heart you know the cosmos vision is about bringing you up in the world right and, and there needs to be adoption there needs to be support for that and and like we were just sort of talking about if we just build some technology and it just gets adopted by you know the finances of the world and like big exchanges and and just sort of ends up being used by you know um financial players in, in sort of the usual way then then maybe we haven't haven't achieved it and what, what the cosmos hub is about is really being a, a centerpiece for that vision of sovereign interoperability and and um you know dedicating itself to supporting that um and and providing services to support the sort of larger ecosystem but always having that sort of vision in mind that it, you know about sustainability and so on it's not just about the technology there's actually a you know political economic um, challenge ahead and, and the crux of the atom is is that it's really there to be this sort of like prime monetary asset within that larger ecosystem that is sort of um, a trusted place, a place that, you know, uh, service providers can integrate against that provides strong guarantees about, you know, being conservative and, and not evolving too quickly and, and messing things up and not taking too much regulatory risk or anything like that. It's really sort of like, you know, a sort of larger sea of, you know, uh, chaos or experimentation or, or innovation, right? So, I mean, you, you could ask, like, is Bitcoin really necessary? Like, blockchains have already won. I mean, yeah, I think Bitcoin is necessary um, for, for a lot of reasons. And so I think it, it's sort of similar with, with the Cosmos Hub and the Atom. You for that and the last question from Redwan Meslam. Hi Redwan. Um, the examples featured in the presentation are fascinating and inspiring. I agree. Um, history shows us all the empowering economic mechanisms, Wurgo, Free Bank, ended up being shut down. So how do we avoid the same? It's a very good question. I don't have an easy answer. I mean, you know, one idea that Bitcoin showed is like, well, if you just build like an unstoppable decentralized network that um you know, sort of censorship resistant and, and, and it's global immediately. Well, good luck shutting that thing down. And, and that's exactly what we've seen. I mean, Ch China bans mining and the mining just, just relocates. I don't know that we've ever witnessed like a relocation of infrastructure at that scale before with like 
without even a peep. Like, it, you know, the network was, was fine. I mean, the profitability of mining went up for a bit, but there was no downtime, no nothing, right? So I think leveraging is on the one hand, we have that kind of weapon to say like, well, now we know how to build technology that you can't shut down. And we've kind of known that for a while. I mean, ever since BitTorrent basically, right? I mean, you know, they managed to shut down Napster, but you know, BitTorrent has kind of taken off. And now, you know, Apple uses BitTorrent to distribute updates and stuff. You know, it's legitimate, right? And and we'll see the same thing happen with Bitcoin. And so that technology is out of the bag, we can use it. That said, at the same time, I'm not someone who thinks like, oh, to hell with all the existing institutions, like burn them all down and, you know, start again, all we need is Bitcoin. I think we do need to find ways to work productively with existing institutions, you know, existing central banks, governments, and so on, and and provide this as a way that, that they can see it as sort of complementary to their mandates, a way to actually better realize their existing mandates than, than the tools that they're using right now, which are very clearly failing. And hopefully even they are starting to see um, that they're failing. So I'm, I'm sort of hoping we can use this like credible threat of like, well, you know, we could just the decentralized way, but we don't want to because like crypto anarchy, is that really what we want for the world? So, you know, let's work together and figure out sort of a path to gracefully roll out local currencies and these sort of alternative uh, or complementary uh, arrangements. That's a great answer. Thank, thank you for, for, yeah, that's another great answer. Um, and again, thank you again for your time, uh, coming here today. Um, that was yeah, a phenomenal talk. Right. Back. I'm sure everyone appreciated it and hopefully we'll see you again next year for part three of Ethan's uh, history lesson talks. And yeah, it's, uh, Sounds thank good. you. Love yeah, having you on. Thank you. Feel free to stick around. Okay. Awesome. Ethan, thank you very much. Again, feel free to stick around for some of the other talks. Um, we got some good ones coming up next, including a lunch break. Um, so um, up next, we have um, Andre, Andre Rakic. Andre Rakic is a developer advocate for Chainlink protocol at Chainlink Labs. Andre is a blockchain engineer, having been in, in the Web3 space since 2016. Oh, he's a veteran. And he was primarily working on open source EVM projects. Andre also runs his educational blog and podcast. And today he will be talking to us about hybrid smart contracts and decentralized Oracle networks. Okay, let's go. Okay, Andre, go ahead, take it, take it away. Hello, hello, thanks, thanks for the intro. Uh, I hope everyone can see me, hear me. Uh, okay, so I will start with uh, some screen sharing. I assume all of you can see this, perfect. Okay, so here are the slides. Uh, yeah, so today I'm going to go over an intro to Chainlink and hybrid smart contracts. Uh, we are going to discuss about Oracle problem and how Chainlink solves it. Uh, also, uh, how it connects hybrid smart contracts to the various products that are offered inside the Chainlink ecosystem. Uh, so, my name is Andrei Rakic. Uh, I'm a blockchain engineer and developer advocate for Chainlink Protocol at Chainlink Labs. Uh, also, one can see my Twitter and LinkedIn handles listed here in case any of you have any further questions uh, after this Q&A session, after this talk, feel free to, to reach me out. Um, so, like, uh, to, to, to understand Chainlink, we first need to understand what is a smart contract uh, why it is important and how it can be beneficial for us. So it's a quick intro. I'm pretty much sure that all of you are like familiar with this, that all of you here uh, watching this conference uh, at least once wrote, wrote some smart contract. Uh, but uh, yeah, quick intro. So uh, what is contract? A contract can be defined as a binding agreement between two or more parties or a legal document that represent that represents that agreement, right? So they started all written on stone and paper, but over the time they evolve. And nowadays it is almost impossible not to have a couple of term sheets signed. For, for example, uh, you make a Netflix subscription, uh, you offer a job to someone, you rent an apartment, you buy a new car, whatever, like uh, contracts is, is now part of our everyday lives. Uh, but the problem with these traditional contracts and agreements is uh, this thing on the graphic no, uh, notice as contract operator. So contract operator uh, is, is some third party which we need to trust in order to, to, to our smart contract be like live and efficient, etc. But uh, this contract operator in some cases can have some conflict of, of interest. 
which is a problem, right? Uh, on the other hand, there are so-called cryptographic agreements. So, and this is like the, the smart contract. So in this case, with, with smart contracts, the, the contract, contract terms are secured by math, by, by cryptography, by blockchain. Now there is no need for us to, to trust anyone else than just the code and the technology itself. Uh, yeah, so smart contracts will, will solve the society critical trust issues. So for example, on, on, on the left side of, of the screen, with traditional contracts, there is a need to trust uh, either the paper, the brand, the contract operator I, I mentioned, right? Uh, this is risky and most of the time, unfortunately, these digital agreements doesn't support the average user all the time, right? Oftentimes when they need the most. So we can maybe uh, mention like um, s s some, some C5 protocols that basically ban the user to, to, train, to trade game stocks when they actually need to trade the most. Like with cryptographic ag agreements, so-called smart contracts, we only need to trust the, the technology itself. So it is like a couple of hundred lines of code deployed to some general purpose blockchain and uh, that code cannot be changed, modified, changed, modified, deleted, corrupt in any other way. So it's 24 seven live and it's on, on blockchain. So everyone can review these term sheets and actually no one can just uh, force anything rather than what is written inside the, the, the smart contract itself. But smart contracts are not perfect and they, they also have like some, some problems. So the main problem with smart contracts is that they are unable to connect with external systems. They're unable to connect with data feeds, with APIs, with existing payment systems or any other off-chain resources on, on, on their own. Like uh, the Oracle, the oracles actually solve this issue, solve this problem. So with oracles, we can provide some external data to the smart contract deployed on a blockchain. So, so, so smart contracts are kind of like isolated in their own environment on in, in their like own blockchains, can read some data from that blockchain, do some computations and that's it. But with off-chain data provided by oracles, we can now have like a fully functional agreements called hybrid smart contracts. But uh, yeah, so this is like the, the, the connectivity problem like with, with smart contract on, on each blockchain, like, uh, I don't know, we, if we have listed here like Ethereum, Bitcoin, Hyperledger, but any like Polygon, Polkadot, whatever, like uh, uh, smart contracts cannot just easily get this, this off-chain data without, without oracles, right? So my smart contract, for example, without Oracle cannot know like what's the current weather at, at Boston, I mean, I, I don't care really, but for for maybe some my smart contracts use case, it is important. So cannot like, just get the price of, of any cryptocurrency, for example, Bitcoin in terms of USD without oracles. Uh, and Chainlink is number one oracle protocol and it, it, it solves all of these issues. So with, with Chainlink, uh, it's, it's an open source protocol. So any of you can just open a pull request, raise an issue. It's a community driven protocol fully decentralized, fully open source. Uh, you can just use Chainlink contracts uh, inside your contract and, and get all of this uh, crucial off-chain uh, data. So, but Oracle's also have like, Oracle Networks has, has some problems. So imagine you have like a smart contract on some general purpose blockchain. It's fully decentralized environment, uh, like bunch of nodes running the network, securing the network, everything's like uh, happened in decentralized manner like everything's happened like in the manner the, we we actually love and want and this is why we using we we use web3 products on a daily basis and then you have some centralized oracle node to get this these data sources from you so so just one node node to like uh, thousands of nodes on blockchain and this centralized node can go down and then we, we don't have like uh, uh, data at all, can be corrupted. And then like the same problem with, uh, with, with, with this uh, contract operator I mentioned before on, on this schema, you need to trust that one centralized node. And this is not okay. Like this is a problem of, not, of, of oracles. If we have a decentralized Oracle network, 
this is much much better for data quality for data privacy for like decentralization everything so we have like smart contracts on any of these blockchains and then there's a decentralized oracle network powered by chainlink to get all of these off-chain data to, to to all of these like smart contracts it, it doesn't really need to be just on ethereum you you, you have like uh, chainlink services offered to a bunch of other blockchains so it's really up to you uh, how you're going to build your smart contracts where you're going to build it build it host it etc but uh, but oracles are kind of like important step in order to 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 make like uh, re really awesome and actually useful smart contracts because like smart contracts are uh, nowadays a backend of our applications and these backends need to be powerful so with chainlink this uh, chainlink is run by decentralized oracle network by by thousands of nodes uh, which also uh, gain some link token in order to like tokens to because of their good and honest work so it's 100% trusted decentralized and now we have like a blockchain which is this decentralized network we have decentralized oracle network and this is just the, the perfect match so what is this term hybrid smart contracts so hybrid smart contracts combine on-chain and off-chain systems and computation so on this picture you can see in top right uh, corner some smart contract on-chain code written in solidity uh, it is basically a simple code same sample uh, for uh, making HTTP GET requests from your smart contract. So with Chainlink, you can uh, call any API and, and get some some data. So uh, uh, so down down right, there's like a bunch of uh, blockchain protocols, and on the left, this is like off-chain world when I when we can just uh, consume external data from enterprise systems from uh, traditional payment systems like PayPal, uh, whatever, like uh, Chainlink is, it's kind of um, a, a bridge for off-chain data and our smart contracts, which, which are on-chain. So what uh, features are currently live and operating on, on Chainlink? Uh, although I must say like, this is awful, like uh, a bunch of new cool features is already uh, being developed by, by a community. Uh, so like, everything as i mentioned like open source public you can check it out and uh, uh ex accept like a, a lot of good and nice features and stuff from chaining in the future but for now like uh, the most important uh, feature so far is are chaining data feeds so with chaining data feeds uh, you can get a price of any cryptocurrency uh, in terms of usd in terms of euro in, in terms of any other um cryptocurrency for example price of bitcoin in terms of ether etc etc and it is important because uh with, with data feeds uh we can write uh, uh, really really uh, efficient and uh correct uh, and, and 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 top like DeFi uh protocols and apps so uh, like DeFi is really hot for it uh, since like the beginning of 2019 or 20 let's say but like with, with data feeds now like you can you can write really really powerful and awesome DeFi apps so how 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 this works so uh, an example so imagine you have on the right your smart contract it's deploying being deployed on on chain and now you want to get the price of for example uh what what token is 400 i don't know like some token uh in terms of in terms of dollars and you make a get request to the Chainlink network to, to get that latest price. And a bunch of uh, nodes inside decentralized Oracle network uh, get this price from, from their like off-chain sources. The, the network knows how to aggregate these, these, uh, these prices uh, to make a median value uh, based on uh, nodes like uh, reputation etc etc and uh, finally as an output we have one one price which is like 400 dollars which is which can be trusted and verified also on on, on blockchain so so uh, the bad nodes are also being punished by the network for not do, doing their job right and uh, to to use these data feeds so you can go to uh, data.chain.link 
uh, you can see like a screenshot from, from this, this web page, but this is like uh, uh, analytics for ETH USD pair. So price of ETH in terms of USD, uh, which oracles are supported, uh, trust dancer right now, heartbeat, last update, responses, etc., etc. So there's uh, two triggers how to when like the, the price is being updated. So uh, either in some time frame or uh, when um, some like I, I think like for ETH USD is like 0.5% change, then you need to like trigger again the Oracle network to get the right right to get the right price. Uh, okay, so this is all nice, but how I can make a killer DeFi app and, and use chaining data feeds? It's pretty simple. So uh, it's one click uh, really deployment. So you need to go to chaining doc documentation dots dot docs dot chain dot link. Uh, find the uh, data feeds, uh, get the latest price like for for EVM chains, but also there's a there's a, a section for non EVM chains like Solana and Terra, and uh, there's a simple code snippet uh, which can you automatically deploy using Remix. So this is I I think like twenty lines of code, and it's that simple to to get like the the, the price of of one cryptocurrency in, in terms of, of in terms of others. So for example, this is uh, also like aggregator for ETH in terms of USD. Uh, USD. I'm uh, going to actually show you in Remix uh, later after these slides how, how you can uh, use this uh, in your smart contract to adjust it a little bit, but it's that simple for a start. Uh, so like a lot of additional info are also in the docs, so feel free to, to check it out. So docs.chain.link. Second feature, is Chainlink VRF. So with Chainlink VRF, uh, uh, we, we have a, a data source for, for randomness for our smart contract, but it's for securing a randomness for our applications. So uh, like I, I, uh, Tim, Tim mentioned that I'm in space like uh, for a couple of years. And uh, back then it was a practice to, to make a, uh, randomness to, to calculate randomness on, on, a, on a chain by uh, hashing with Ketchak hashing some uh, block timestamp, some salt, some whatever parameter, and this is bad, right? Th th this is this is malicious code. Uh, there's actually a hack attack known as source on, source of randomness attack. So please don't calculate randomness on chain like. Uh, it's not it's 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 bad like it's not good like i actually saw like uh, one tweet where, where some developer uh wanted to give some nfts to his followers and he calculates some randomness on chain but he specifically said this is bad don't use this in production i made this crypto giveaway for three people and i deployed this in memory on my remix just to to, for like fan to to like thank you for for following me, me on Twitter, but please please do not uh, make uh, write your smart contracts and and put it in production like like this way. So so what's the better way? The the better way and the, the trusted way is to actually use Chainlink VRFs because this feature provides a verifiable ver verifiable randomness to to your smart contract. So. Uh, I had like a, an, an interesting uh, conversation like a couple of days ago or weeks, I don't know, with, with uh, uh, one of the co-authors of uh, ERC721 standard, which was basically, uh, he, he tweeted like, uh, uh, I'm not sure how Chainlink is doing randomness, like, uh, uh, is this reliable or, or not? And uh, he specifically asked not to share with him some Chainlink docs, for example. Uh, and I answer like with him, like uh, give give him a uh, uh, three or four or five I don't know like GitHub links, uh, point him to to some uh, things in the repo because as I said everything is open source, everything's public. And after that, like he he, he didn't like he had some like I mean he thanks me thanked me and he had no no doubts and further conversation, which is good, right? So how how this uh, VRF is working? Uh, uh, basically, uh, you send a request to a decentralized Oracle network, and then that uh, Oracle network uh, uh, calculates random number, 
and then it uh, it make a cryptographic proof on a blockchain and then like you, anyone can verify on blockchain that this ra random number is really uh, random right because like as i said like nodes can be malicious also but with this cryptographic proof written on a blockchain we're 100 percent sure that this is like um, th this is like correct value so uh, right now like it's it's truth greater than trust right so we we, we right now not, don't need to trust like no third party we, we actually don't need to trust like the, the chain and collapse team for example because everything is open source and public we can just verify the truth and this is like the the pure power of, of web3 in my mind so uh, why do i need randomness i i mentioned like uh, some crypto giveaways but also you can play with nfts for example uh, you can make games so you can make for example like uh, if i make uh, made online uh, on on chain like uh, uh, some in-game warrior character and it can like have 33 percent of chance to use this sword in this uh, on chain bat battle and there's like uh, 50 50 percent uh, with hit and miss this is like output randomness this is all cool and nice features uh, to uh, and, and use cases for for chaining vrf also in on our blog there is blog the chain link there is uh, actually a great ex uh, article about 77 use cases uh for chain link vrf randomness which, which is which is amazing right uh third third uh, service that i wanted to talk with you today are chain link keepers so chain link keepers uh went live during this year uh and it's decentralized event driven execution so kind of like cron job on develop on and or devops things for your smart contracts uh so let, let's look at, at, at this uh, schema so uh, smart contracts as far as you know already are uh, by, by by its nature like uh, it, it's it's kind of like um, uh, slow and you need to like if you have a smart contract in order to change the state you need to trigger your smart contract to initiate some transaction in in order to to something to happen right and uh, imagine you have uh, thousands of users you make some DeFi aggregator yield app whatever and uh, you need to have some specific actions at specific time and you need to some do some yield farming to a couple of protocols and uh, first way is to be in front of your computer all the time and just click and initiate transactions but eventually like the job is going to become much much bigger that even you cannot handle but much easier way is to use chainlink keepers network so what is this chainlink keepers network so your smart contract development team need to create a keeper job register uh, register on like um, um, chainlink network on there's a smart contract i will explain it later and then like uh, on each node uh, each block this, this keeper network is going to ping your smart contract and, and ask him uh, and ask it's like do you need some upkeep do you need some something from me like so let's let's start with with an example so imagine you're doing yield farming on like this this four protocols so we have uniswap contract we have sushi swap contract we have yarn finance contract and we have balancer contract and on the left side there is skippers network and uh, in order to to use chain keepers you need to uh implement keeper compatible interface it's uh, really just two functions to be implemented i will show you uh the, the demo after these slides but after we implement this keeper compatible interface we register our upkeep to do this registry con smart contract and fund it with some link tokens and and leave it and that's it like uh it, it's going to consume that link tokens for it, its work and we're just ready to 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 just relax and, and watch everything going smoothly uh, earn some passive income while we're sleeping etc 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 so how, how would this work so uh on every block the keepers check the register for eligible upkeeps so on the left you have like a keeper node so uh um, initiating check transaction to the keeper registry and then keeper registry uh ask like in in this particular use case this uniswap smart contract and this yarn finance smart contracts 
uh, uh, do they need some upkeep, like the, the check? And this check can return true or false. That's it. Like if it's false, nothing happens. So for example, uh, on this young smart contract, it's ineligible for upkeep, doesn't need anything at the moment, good to go. Or it can return true, which is uh, in, in this example, units for smart contracts, it's, uh, it, it is eligible for, for upkeep and also like it can return some additional data, uh, which is like perhaps need for, for this upkeep. So this data is then being transferred to, to the uh, upkeep node and this upkeep node now performs perform upkeep with that data. If there's no need for data, either it, it's, it's, it's good, but uh, also like uh, there, there's there's a feature for that. So so to pass that data as an argument to your perform perform a function and then like upkeep is completed. There's a new transaction on a blockchain and you didn't do anything, right? You maybe I don't know read some book at a time or watch that Netflix. I, I mentioned that Netflix subscriptions before. Or I don't know, like travel doesn't matter. Like you, you earn passive income, basically while 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 you're sleeping with with these chain keepers. So before this learning section, I will I will now do a quick demo of these features. So I mentioned uh, data feeds. So if you go to Chainlink uh, smart contract dots, this is docs chain link, and there are this uh, price feeds. So data feeds. So if I go to data feeds. And this is like for EVM. Also, there's a section for non-EVM contracts platforms. I, I mentioned like um, uh, Terra and, and Solana, but like more to come. Uh, if I scroll a little bit down, this is the the, the code snippet I, I showed you uh, earlier during the slides. And it's this simple to, to get the price fit. So you need to install or if you're in Remix, don't install anything. If you're in Hardhat on Proudly, you need to install uh, a Chainlink um, dash uh, contracts package. But import that from that package, uh, aggregator v3 interface contract. And uh, this is like the, the one function get latest price. So this price feeds, call this latest round data, can get all of this info, but for our use case this price is just important and if you click here uh, it will be automatically going uh, deployed inside the remix so maybe you don't see this i will zoom it a little bit but this is like the same uh code snippet uh, in the docs uh you you see this is like a hard code hard coded stuff for, for so this is the oracle address for uh, ETH in terms of USD aggregator on Kava network. I can uh, scale this a little bit so I can uh, address price feed. I can pa pass this this address as an argument to my to my function and do something like this. So uh, aggregator interface uh, it's like this price feed is aggregator interface of this price feed address, right? Uh, price feed address it's better naming price feed address and and that's it like and uh, to actually check all of these price feeds addresses i can go here so contract addresses for like bunch of uh, blockchains for example for ethereum data feeds uh, you can see like uh, these all of these aggregate uh, addresses for ethereum mainnet also, like for Kovan, if you scroll a little bit down, Rinkeby, okay, you want to build something on Polygon, we got you, like Polygon mainnet, etc., etc., etc. Also, I really like this new feature, so it's like ENS, so you can uh, look up pairs uh, like this, like for, from ENS. So eth-usd.data.eth is basically uh, an ENS, like, okay, Aave, etc., etc. Uh, okay. Uh, what else? I wanted to, to show you a little bit of keepers. So if I go here and uh, this is like the, the intro and overview of chaining keepers in the docs, uh, we can just um, make compatible contracts. Okay, so this is the two functions that I mentioned, 
like uh, mentioned before, check upkeep and perf perform upkeep. So you remember that the slides where I check for upkeeps and then if they're eligible, like Uniswap contract, for example, was eligible, I, I, I performed upkeep. So, so check upkeep checks if the contract requires work to be done, perform, perform upkeep, performs the work in the contract if instructed by check upkeep. So uh, the flow is always you need to check for upkeep and if this function returned true, then the perform upkeep is being called. Otherwise, this is not impossible. This is not possible. So most of the time, this check upkeep function will be view and not cost you any of the gas and uh, perform upkeep, right? It, it needs to, to initiate some transaction, but maybe not if you make uh, some pure function and do some internal calculations like some cron jobs, this is also like free for you, for example. So, so this is good, right? Uh, okay, so if you click this deploy or, or con this contract using Remix, you will see this code snippet inside your, your Remix uh, ID. So I can just put this a little bit down, okay, that you can see better. So yeah, so I also like imported from Chainlink Contracts package, Keeper compatible interface. And um, uh, Keeper compatible contract, but inside this contract is Keeper compatible interface. So my contract called counter, but it can be like whatever, need to implement it, this interface. And right now it's it's pretty simple contract. So basically it at some points of time, like kind of cram job, uh, increments this counter pretty simple i mean it's it's okay for like showing these use cases uh, like the, the, it's okay to, to show you how how these uh keepers are, are 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 working but like this is not a common use case for you guys like most of the time in this perform upkeep you will do some harvesting or yield farm or whatever like but uh yeah so this chap upkeep uh has all this like check data also and this check data uh, you can uh, set uh, during the register during the registering your 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 upkeep so like uh, during this 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 transaction how to say it like and uh, most of the time it's going to be a view function and it returns two parameters uh, boolean value upkeep needed true false and as i mentioned in the slides additional perform data and uh, it you can see it's bytes so it can be whatever you can just it, it, it scales like like uh, in any directions you want like, like you, you can build whatever you want with this so upkeep needed for for this particular use case we uh, get block timestamp and the last timestamp and we check is this value is greater than our interval famous interval uh if true uh the perform upkeep function is going to be called the false nothing. We don't return any perform data, but for example, uh, maybe we have some mapping of some, let's say, contracts or, or protocols that we want to, let's say, yield farm. And then we can do some perform data, let's say, like, uh, I don't know, return me this address, like from this, let's say we have a mapping, some contracts of, let's say, this, I don't know, like ID, whatever, uh, that address, like return, I, I need that data, for example, like, I mean, it's, uh, I'm mocking this up, but you, you, you have the feeling like, like why this perform data is important to us. And then like I have perform upkeep function, uh, which as one parameter take this perform data. So this perform data is an argument of this perform upkeep function uh, like in our case it's basically set this last timestamp uh, variable to block timestamp and increments this counter by one but in in your case will be do uh, do whatever you want right we can farm uh, harvest uh, whatever like it's it's really up to you how are you going to uh, to use this this network so uh let's get back to the slides where i can learn uh how to use chainlink besides this talk like this is pretty basic and standard like code samples so first and most important research for you is 
uh, official docs, so docs.chain.link, uh, all of the like uh, from beginner friendly uh, code snippets and information to the more advanced usage. You can see APIs and details and read all of this for, for all of the features and it can be really helpful and beneficial. Second one, blog.chain.link. You, uh, you have our blog, which is updated on, on a daily basis, I can say, like a lot of good, new, fresh, and uh, really useful content is being produced by awesome community uh, behind, like uh, uh, from Ch Chainlink Labs. Uh, you can see how to fetch IPFS data in smart contracts using external adapters. You can see how to deploy uh, smart contracts, which is using pr price feeds on Avalanche or Arbitrum or whatever, like uh, really, uh, really informative and useful tutorials step by step. So you can read a lot of uh, go good and quality content here. Uh, third is a Chainlink YouTube channel. So a lot of engineering tutorials and developer workshops. Uh, it was pretty busy and active during uh, uh, Hackathon. So Chainlink is currently hosting a, a Hackathon. Uh, I mean, like, uh, as far I read on, on, on Chainlink Twitter account currently, uh, it's, um, it's in, in judging process. Uh, people like the teams are, are done with their work so far. But during this Hackathon, uh, they had the ability to, to watch a bunch of very, very useful workshops on a daily basis. Also, like uh, a lot of uh, good tutorials are, are being deployed here and, and some short video explanations. Uh, so feel free to, to check it out. Like it's it's chain link on, on YouTube. And finally, our Solidity and Smart Contract Starter Kits. So it's on GitHub. So as I said, this is the, the organization when you can verify all of the repos and how, how everything works under the hood. So don't trust, verify, uh, truth is greater than trust. And our smart starter kits, we have a truffle starter kit, we have a brownie starter kit, and we have a hard hat starter kit. So uh, this is like boilerplate plate codes for you to clone these repos and start building with chaining. So with beginner friendly examples to more and more advanced, uh, I highly uh, recommend to, to check this out. It, it's really, uh, really useful. Like, for development, so don't initiate your, for example, anti hard hat project. Start with this; like it's really up to date, and just keep go keep building. Uh, yeah, if you want to learn even more, uh, there's a Discord channel. So uh, make sure to join our Discord. Uh, a lot of uh, really useful communication and conversation behind between uh, community members. I mentioned Starter Kids on GitHub. There's documentation that I mentioned. Those the check that link. And finally, uh, the, there's a bunch of uh, chilling questions and answers on Stack Overflow. So if you are not sure how to write something, or you're not hundred percent sure why is this working as it's why it's work as it works on, or how to I don't know like uh, uh, get even more from keepers or price feeds or call any API, whatever. So there's a, a specific tag. Uh, Chainlink or Stack Overflow. So just go to this link, search for uh, Chainlink tag questions on, on Stack Overflow, or just manually type your, as we all do, like type your your questions in the browser, and you will come up with uh, with Stack Overflow link pop up in front of your 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 laptop. And I, I think like this is uh, really uh, helpful resources and more than enough resources to to to. To, to use Oracle networks to, to make hybrid smart contracts, to make killer apps, uh, dApps, killer dApps with hybrid smart contracts. So uh, this is all for, for, for me that I had for this talk. If you have any question, uh, feel free to ask. Hey, dude, thank you so much for um, presenting on Chainlink. You provided a lot of great resources for people to learn um how to you know deploy their own oracle networks and all that stuff um yeah thank you thank you for yeah, pr providing the resources thank you for giving us the demo um and what is it here yeah chain link uh decentralized oracle networks it seems like such critical pieces of infrastructure for web3 so um definitely always nice to learn about um 
uh, about Chainlink. So, um, okay, we have one question from the audience, um, and then we'll go to a short lunch break. But first of all, the first question, what are some other use cases for Chainlink besides DeFi that excites you most? There are a couple of use cases like for NFT, random NFTs, or uh, like call API, get make HTTP get requests and etc. But uh, what excites me the more, uh, the most is like uh, uh, it's actually one hackathon project developed by by Harry. Uh, he he's currently uh, also DA for for Chainlink protocol, the Chainlink Lab. So he made a product called Link My Ride, and he actually made a system where you can uh, 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 schedule your uh, Tesla ride on Uber using uh, chaining from smart contract and it's like uh, amazing like uh, really really creative solution so it's really up to you how you're going to to use these features and be creative as possible I remember seeing the um, the link my ride um, hackathon project I think it was from like last year or something it was really really cool to see someone like build this thing and then like use their phone and chain link to unlock their Tesla car. It was, yeah, it was awesome. And definitely a very exciting feature of, of, um, of you know, what can be enabled by an Oracle network. So um, I, I believe that's it for questions. So Andre, thank you for your time. Thank you so much for stopping by. Um, you know, like feel free to stick around and listen to some other talks too. Um, but yeah, thank you again and I uh, appreciate it. And we'd love to have you back on in some capacity, some like maybe in another event. So thank you. It was my, thank you. Okay, folks, that concludes the morning session of CSCon one day three, the final day of the, uh, web three extravaganza. Um, we're going to take a short break. I need to eat lunch. I'm so hungry right now. So it'll be 15 minutes. Lion, I'm so sorry. We'll, I promise we'll get to you. Um, your, your talk will start at, you know, 1245, I think. So um, thank you for your patience, but also um, see y'all soon.